Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hillary. Michelle Rowan is president of the Work From Home Alliance, an industry forum that organizes workshops, events, and toolkits, all focused on helping companies implement work from home programs. Michelle has a background leading the customer contact team at Hilton Hotels and overseeing their own move into work from home agents. So she's got practical background experience of doing this, as well as consulting. We're now in a transition period as most countries recover from the pandemic and many executives are exploring if or how work from home can be retained in some form in their business. So I called Michelle to ask for her advice on what's really happening. Okay, Michelle, um, before we start the the interview properly, maybe you could just introduce the the Work From Home Alliance and maybe your own background and how, why you founded it. Yeah, thanks. Um, Yeah, so uh, I've been working in the contact center space for 15 years, Um, spent 12 years with Hilton Hotels, and all of that was in the reservation or contact center um, arm, and that's where I got my experience with the work from home model. We deployed it at Hilton uh, in Europe and in the U.S., and I led those deployments and uh, saw all the great benefits for individuals as well as for business, there seemed to me that there was no downside. So uh, I started my own consultancy, helping companies design, deploy, and continuously improve the work from home model. Um, and I do that through public conferences and events that I hold to bring together leaders so that they can share their insights and experiences and challenges and all that good stuff, and also through custom consulting. So Uh, Yeah, I launched the Work From Home Alliance to create a central place for leaders to be able to come and gather and share their experiences and their insights around work from home, heavy emphasis on the contact center model, um, and also support and enterprise functions. Um, And we share experiences through, again, virtual events that are live and also through a 24 by 7 discussion forum that we have available toolkits um, and soon to be in in in-person conferences uh, coming again soon. So, yeah. Okay. That's great. Thanks. Well, it's great that you, you know, you have experience with Hilton of actually rolling out work from home and you've spent about a decade or so actually advising other companies on how to do this. Um, The executives and people that you're talking to now, uh, have they accepted that this is now for the long term and it's no longer just a response to the pandemic? Yes, I would have to say finally, Mark, uh, the time has arrived. It, it took a pandemic, it did. Uh, but but those, those individuals that were reserved or uh, spooked by the work from home model have fully accepted it. And frankly, I don't know of one company right now that's not using work from home or planning to continue to use it in some capacity going forward. So it's, it's been mature in the contact center space for quite some time, but the, uh, you know, again, those that had reservations, uh, those, that ship has sailed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And is there, um, not just from the corporate side, but from the employee side, are employees expecting this kind of flexibility? It, it's more like a way of life rather than, you know, just, just a way to get people into a contact center. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good way of putting it. I mean, that's what I'm seeing, and uh, you know, and everybody I talk to, all of my colleagues say the same thing. I mean, if you look at um, expectations of people today, they're different than they were uh, 18 months ago, and the uh, you know the ability to to be quite independent. Um, and to have a lot of flexibility in one's life, they are uh, kind of baseline expectations right now. So again, I, I don't know of one way, um, organization that's not going to be offering work from home in some capacity. And I think beyond that, the next iteration of that is what we're going to see with work from anywhere. A lot of companies have already embraced that with their employees. They've grown to be that flexible during the pandemic. And I think we're going to see that that continue to expand um, in coming years as well. So the baseline is going to be work from home. And then the longer shot will be uh, the expectation, the higher bar will be work from anywhere. That's what Mm. I see. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's like me living down here in Brazil and just, just delivering go. books and podcasts all over the all world. All over the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I wanted to ask you about the possible impact on real estate. You know, we have all these massive contact centers all over the world and, and just more generally offices. And I guess that it's very difficult to give a general answer, you know, what is the impact on real estate? Um, but, but based on perhaps your clients and the people that you're talking to, what, what, what have they been saying about what are they going to do about their leases and the amount of, um, um, you know, like square feet that they actually have? Yeah. Um, again, it is early days, so we don't see hard numbers yet, but based on a lot of conversations I've been having over the last six months um, in the contact center space, I'm seeing a lot of organizations that are planning to release facilities as quickly as they can. Um, and where they still have commitments, they will repurpose facilities to take on some different roles. So um, not only will they be used for office working for some percentage of the population, a very small part, um, but office facilities will be used for communal gatherings, for town hall meetings, for volunteer work, even for family gatherings. So in terms of numbers, um, most organizations are planning on reductions of anywhere from 50 to 100 percent of real estate holdings. So in the contact center space, I think we're going to land somewhere around 50 to 75 percent reductions overall in real estate. Wow, that's uh, that's considerable. Yeah, big numbers. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the repurposing that you just mentioned there um, could be an actual benefit, but uh, not an obvious benefit. I mean, are, are there any other sort of benefits of this process? Um, I mean, I was thinking of things like, um, because we're now so focused on information security, because people are scared of those those connections in people's homes, we may actually have seen an, an increase in information security. Um, you know, and I know that now a lot of contact centers are exploring things like gig CX, you know, paying people by the customer served rather than the, the hourly rate. I, I mean, do you see any 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 other sort of um, you know, benefits that are not immediately obvious. Yeah, I, and those are two great examples, I think. Um, certainly, um, you know, the digitalization experience that um, we've, we've had over the last 18 months has been huge leaps forward, I think, for everyone in their business lives and their personal lives. So the expectation from our customers is that um, in, in our industry, that we're going to be able to meet them where they are. So I think that with the reduction in real estate holdings in particular, it frees up the cash and the capital for companies to finally make the investments in technology to bring us into the 21st century and, and fully support digital the way that our customers expect us to. Um, so investments in, you know, cloud technology, um, investments in security, certainly that goes hand in hand, I think, when you're when you're supporting a distributed work environment, investments in uh, all kinds of technology, starting with hiring and sourcing. I mean, the days of in-person interviews, that's gone. We're not going to see that again. It's digital now. Um, so investments in that investments in learning. Um, digital learning and all the stuff involved in effectively digitally uh, supporting people, virtual performance support, everything from managing mixed teams and leader capabilities and um, giving people the ability to get work done and connect with each other on an emotional level and a so social level and making that as easy as it is or it was when we were all co-located in an office. Those are big investments. Um, but they're not really kind of, you know, on a wish list anymore. If you're going to have a large population of people that are distributed, they're kind of calls to action. They're investments that need to be made. So I think we're going to see a lot of that, and it's all going to be positive stuff over the next couple of years. Yeah, that's really interesting because it, it seems as if there's – um, th there was like a five-year plan for investment in technology, and, and almost everybody's realized they need that transformation now. Yeah, now the gloves are off. Uh, and now, again, there's some, there's some intention with investment. There's some freed up resources that were unplanned. Yeah. So I'm seeing companies just go for it. I really am. Yeah. I, I mean, is that what they need to do? I mean, particularly within the contact centers. I mean, how do they move on from this just being a response to the pandemic and needing to keep the lights on and the business going? Um, 
how do they look at this now as a, as a completely new way of doing business? Yeah, I, and I think we touched on you queued up a couple of those points already. The re, you know the facilities um, and repurposing of them, the reengineering in terms of technology for customer experience um, and employee experience, and then the other piece of it is really just like you said, it's 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 reimagining um, the workplace. Um, and reimagining work from home and taking it from a staffing strategy, which is how we've always looked at it in the contact center space. It was just a way to hire people and reimagining that to a way that we work. Um, so we have to think about uh, ultimately a geo-neutral life, life cycle for our employees. So regardless of where people sit, that becomes secondary. We're thinking about how people get stuff done, how they get their jobs done, and how they're going to emotionally collect, connect to company culture, how they're going to be exposed to it, how they're going to be on a regular basis, how they're going to have access to it, how they're going to have access to their colleagues on a social level, on a business level. Um, so all that stuff has to be reimagined. And I think what needs to happen is that companies need to walk through literally all of their workflows, all of their business processes, revisit all of the guidelines and the policies, not just react to the fires, which is what we did during the emergency, right? That's, that's the best we could do. But now it's time to go through really everything uh, in terms of the way we work and our workflows and business processes and, and guidelines um, and lay it over with that strategy of uh, work from home is a, is a way that work gets done as opposed to a staffing strategy. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, and I think that there's probably a lot, quite a few people who were caught up in this just because of the emergency. Um, they went home, they, they've been working from home for the past year, but they would actually prefer to be back in an office, you know, where, where yeah. they live, if they live in a shared home or they have kids or, or other people, and maybe they just don't even have enough private space to, to set yeah. up a desk. Um, so how do we sort of integrate these people back into the workforce in a way that, that respects the fact that they still want an office, even though we're seeing this transition to work from home as normal? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've talked to many companies and at every company, there's a there's a percentage of people that want to, for whatever reasons, continue to work in an office environment. And I don't know of one company that's not accommodating that, frankly. So there is office space, whether it's the home office or the, you know, the dedicated office in the town where someone worked or if that's being repurposed uh, perhaps there's new hub facilities that are being brought up. I'm seeing companies even use like, you know, communal workspace like WeWork and things like that in communities to make sure we're looking after those people that we hired for 100 percent in office jobs to be able to continue that um, rather than lose them, um, which would be a terrible alternative to, to lose that talent. Yeah, 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 so I'm definitely seeing those accommodations being made. And the great news is there's lots of options today to mm. make that work yeah yeah i mean there, there are i mean you could just give someone a we work card and give them access yeah. to, to their nearest we work and, and chances and, are they're probably not the only person in their town that works for the company so mm. so there would be some sense of um you know company community some comrade community mm. um even in a in a space like a we work mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so just to wrap up finally then, um, if we're looking at the 2020s more generally, the next few years, what, what do you think are some of the sort of key work from home trends, especially this year as we see the economy opening up again, but, but perhaps looking into next year as well? Yeah, I think we're going to see those changes in, you know, we're going to see large populations of people that are invited to have choice. Um, to work from home versus in office, to flex, maybe both, depending on the role they play, depending on maybe their, their longevity in the company, depending upon, you know, company objectives and culture and stuff like that. We'll, we'll see a lot of that real estate shift begin. We're definitely going to see in tandem with that the investments in the technology first going to the cloud because our customers are demanding it. And that's going to feed into a better employee experience and we'll see some of those other investments and in technologies for, for just that, the digital employee experience. It, those things are kind of like must-haves. It's kind of like you can't have thousands of people or even hundreds of people working from home without use of video as a baseline. And, th and that's something everybody finally did, right, as a response to 
uh, the emergency. So I think we're going to see a lot of that happen this year. And probably, you know, the catch up will be that overhaul of workflows and business processes, even though reluctantly, I hate to think that it's going to be last, but it may well be because it's, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of other stuff that has to get done. But we're going to have some good markers that we'll be able to watch over the next year. I think we'll be able to look at transition to the cloud and we'll be able to measure that, right? We'll hear that reported out. Um, we'll be able to measure the real estate activity, uh, labor force participation rates. We'll be able to see right now there is definitely a temporary problem in hiring. We know that. Uh, certainly in the United States, it's big because of unemployment benefits and people are making different choices in terms of, you know, going back to work right now versus three months from now. I think uh, gig economy growth across sectors is going to be another good marker uh, for us, and they'll all be things that we can we can watch. It'll be interesting. All right, Michelle, that's great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for downloading the CX Files podcast. If you have a moment, please give us a star rating or review on your favorite podcast provider because this really helps other people to find the podcast. If you have any suggestions for future guests, uh, or ideas, people or topics, then please just find myself, Mark Hillary or Peter Ryan on LinkedIn and send a suggestion.